This message this afternoon is, if you don't work, you don't eat. And uh, it's found there in 2 Thessalonians uh, 3, and let, go there to verse 8 through 10, and let's just go ahead and read that uh, for the beginning of the message. It says, Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you, not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. So before we even get into the gist of the message, I mean, a couple of things stand out here. He says in verse 8, says, Neither did we eat any man's bread for not. We didn't just eat it for the sake of eating it, but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. In other words, we don't want you to go around saying that we're, we're taking... Uh, of the ministry or that we're doing of the work of people contributing just so that you can point fingers and lose, you know, lose sight of what we're talking about. It says, not because we have not power. In other words, Paul knew that they had authority and that they could just go ahead and partake because they knew they were doing the work. But he says, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. He says, look, but we needed to lead by example. We didn't just follow, but we all, I mean, we didn't just lead. We also followed by saying, look, if we're going to ask something of you, it's because we're also willing to do it ourselves. It says, for even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not, if any of you, if any would not work, neither should he eat. And we're specifically talking to those, uh, it, you know, this message is specifically geared to those that are in Christ. It, it, the purpose of my message and, and the, what, what we're reading here is to those that are of the faith, and there's two things that we're seeing here. You know, it's real interesting because I actually went back and I read 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians because I, I wanted to make sure we were in context. And, you know, Thessalonians is, is popular because it's known for, you know, the, the argument of the pre-trip versus the post-trip. and it says there's a falling away and all these things. But what's interesting is I was actually, uh, I'm actually going to preach on work, you know, and how we should work and what it is that it is to be a man that works not only for the Lord, but for providing for his family. We're going to cover those points. But what really stood out is that First and Second Thessalonians talks a lot about work and about how, look, you're either going to be doing the work of the Lord and because of these things you're reaping some of these rewards. And if you're not willing to do the work of the Lord, then be quiet and not a busybody and then just do your work and be a member of, uh, of the church, but don't be a stumbling block to others. And we're going to see that here shortly. But just real quick, it is interesting to me that the, work, the, the word work and the word labor, even though they're synonymous to some extent, there is a small separation. And I just want to give you those definitions just so we know that it, it, it's uh, interesting that the labor is more of the exertion of muscular strength or bodily exertion with occasions of weariness. So, you know, when we're laboring, it's something that we're doing is exertion of mental powers intellectual exertion, it's toilsome, toilsome work, pains. Obviously, the Bible also talks about the labor or the travail of pain of birth. So we're talking about labor pains. Work itself is, in general sense, it's, it's like the purpose of, of what you do with something. It's not, that's why I think it's interesting that it says work and labor, and then again, in the same, in the same verses, we're going to see busybodies. Because there's people that are busybodies, but don't necessarily work. You know, the Bible talks about, I mean, the Bible, the the, the definition of work that, that, that just is out there is, in a general sense, to move or to move one way or another, uh, to labor, to be occupied in performing ma manual labor, uh, to carry out an operation, to operate, meaning it's something that's engaged in with a purpose. When we work or labor, we're doing something that's, that's taking our energy and our focus, and it requires for us to be focused on it. So there's a way... We can be, uh, we can do labor in vain, unfruitful uh, work, meaning that it just, all we're doing is spinning our wheels, or we can do work that leads to a purpose. You know, and the reason that this, well, the second reason, the first reason this triggered was just, I thought, you know, we should always preach everything in the Bible, and the Bible talks a lot about work. And, and I'm going to correct the statement I made a few weeks ago where most of the statements that I said, most of the times you find the word work, in the Bible, it has a negative connotation, but the reality is, you know, I corrected myself. I went through and read as much as I could. And it's probably, you know, just it's in the context of what you're reading. Obviously, we're talking about work salvation. That's a negative connotation. But the Bible also gives us, you know, God, the first mention of work is when God finished his work 
in creation. If you go to Genesis, you know, actually don't go there while we're doing this. Go to uh, 1 Timothy 5, I mean, go to 1 Thessalonians 1.1, 1, 1, and, but I'm going to just jump there. to Gen Go to 1 Thessalonians 1. In the meantime, I'm going to be in Genesis 2.1. It's the first time the, the, the word work is used. You see that thus the heavens, in Genesis 2.1, it says, thus the heavens and earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he hath made. You know, the, the, the work, the motion, the creation, the purpose that he did. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because, in, in that, it, because that in it, he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. And what's interesting is if you were to ask anybody what was Adam's punishment for their sin, you know, and I did actually ask my wife, just I wanted to make sure that that was a, a true statement. But that's a true statement in the sense that most people, if you ask them what was Adam's punishment for his sin, is that he would have to work with his hands. And that's true. But it's interesting that if you go to Genesis 3.17, God never uses the word work to, to denote that because obviously there's good work, the work that God made, and then there's, you know, uh, the, the work, that, the toil that we have from the sin. And I believe, in, and this is my opinion, this is actually, I'm just giving you an opinion here, that because in Genesis 2, he had just finished the work and he saw that it was good. In Genesis 3, he punished them by just letting them know that it was from the toil of their, the sweat of their brow. Now, you know, obviously that's work and you, you, we can make an argument about that. I'm not set on this. It's not like hard doctrine, but it's just something that really stood out to me that immediately after when he's given us his word, he doesn't use the word work. If you go to Genesis 3.17, it says, And Adam, and unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, Cursed is the ground for thy sake, in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. So if we see, if we just follow this logic, God established work before the fall, and then he gave us work with obstacles as a punishment. So he never took away the work. So working is good. Being a worker, being someone who's going to take on a, a responsibility, who's going to take on a purpose is a good thing. But the thing that, uh, we're gonna, that I want to focus on is, you know, if you look at Thessalonians from 1 uh, Thessalonians 1 all the way to Thess 2 Thessalonians 3, the theme that we see here is that the work should be for the Lord in everything that we entail. And the things we're going to focus on is actual work, you know, work like our jobs or, or the things that bring in money to provide for a family. But we're also going to see how that ties into the work of the Lord and to the work of our families and to the spiritual raising of people. So if we go uh, to first, uh, that's, you guys are in first Thessalonians one. Let me just read real quick for you. First Timothy five, eight. And the first thing we've got to, we've got to, that I wanted to point out or that I want us to look at is that God wants us to work to provide. You know, God worked seven days and he provided creation for man. And he pre provided a help meet and he provided Adam with a purpose to name everything. I mean, we, we could go back to Genesis 1 and 2. And then, uh, but we want to work to provide according to God's will. In 1 Timothy 5, it says, But if any not provide, if any not provide for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. And if you were to go back to 1 Timothy, it's talking about the church and, you know, the, the role of, of women, the role of the elders and the role of the, the, the bishop and the role of other members in the church. And it says, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel, saying, look, if any not provide uh, if any provide not for his own, it's not just, and I know this verse is used a lot for saying like you need to provide for your house, but it's also for providing the spiritual nourishment, the spiritual meat and milk and tools necessary for you to grow as a disciple in Christ. If you go to 1 Thess Thessalonians 1, we'll back this up. In verse 1, it says, Paul and Salvanius and Timotheus, and I want you to focus that as three people because obviously we know at least Timothy 
was under the leadership of Paul. He got trained by Paul, right? Paul led him to the Lord. Paul, he was, a, you know, he calls him his spiritual son. It says, unto the church of Thessalonians, which is in God, the Father, and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith. So the thing he's focused on is the work of of their faith he says and labor of love so he's talking about work and the labor the toil the 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 physical and mental strain and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God our Father knowing brethren beloved beloved your election of God for our gospel came not unto you in word only but also in power and in the Holy Ghost in much assurance as ye know what manner of men we were among for your sake, and ye became followers of us, and the Lord having received the word in much affliction with joy in the Holy Ghost. So the thing that we're seeing here is that Paul is talking about how he is, he's happy and he's giving thanks because they followed his example and Sylvanus' example and Timotheus' example, and because they did those things, they followed the example of work, they have the work of faith, they have the labor of love, and they have patience and hope. And it says, because you became and you received the word in much affliction with joy in the Holy Ghost. So a couple of things we see here. Well, labor, I just read to you, is, is like that toil, that affliction. Like, you know, if you're out in a garden, you're, it's not like you're going to feel better. You might feel healthier. But if you work out all day, like in a garden or, or you're doing some heavy lifting, you're going to be tired at the end of the day. He says, look, you're, you're being a follower of us. And of the Lord having received the word in much affliction. Meaning, when you study the word, you're tired. When you're preaching the word, you're tired. When you're having to contend for the word, you're tired. When you're having to do the work of the Lord, there's affliction. Because, you know, with uh, preaching the word of God comes what? Persecution and trials and tribulation and stumbling blocks. And if we go to, uh, you guys go to 1 Thessalonians 4. I'll just close out this point. The work provide in Matthew eleven twenty five. 25. You know, the big point I want to make here is, you know, I, I could have just done a whole message just on working to provide. But the fact of the matter is that God wants us to be responsible individuals, men of God that are going to get up every morning and have a purpose and know that God will provide and that God will provide for our needs, for our family's needs and for those that we are ministering to in the faith. It says there in Matthew eleven twenty five, 25, while you guys are turning to 1 Thessalonians 4, it says, At the time Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for it seems so good in thy sight, all things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomever the Son will reveal him. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Who does he, he didn't say, come unto me. He's obviously speaking to those that know the Father and the Son. He's not saying, come to me, those that are sitting around twiddling your thumbs. He says, come to me, ye that labor and are heavy laden. In other words, your, your labor is hard and you have heavy burdens on your life. And he says, and I will give you rest. And then he says, look, and you're going to take up. Now, uh, let's not add that, right? Let's just read in context and then I'm gonna, I'll preach it. But it says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lonely in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So see, he, the Lord understands that when we're doing the work of the Lord, there's times where the labor is hard and that yoke or the, we're heavy laden, we're burdened with certain things. And he says, look, just come to him, come to his word, recognize who he is and his yoke is easy and his burden is light. So the first thing he says, look, you got to get up there and you got to work to provide. And I know there's a ton of other verses that talk about working and doing these things, but I think these are relevant because if you don't have your spiritual walk right, it's hard to go to work every day. It's hard to want to provide for your family every day, especially young men. Young men have a tendency to want to be selfish. And, you know, they're not looking, they look at marriage and, and they look at children and they look at uh, running a house as a burden. You know, the reality is that we, we've raised men 
in, in such a way that all they want to do is play video games. I, just this last week, I was down in uh, McAllen, Texas uh, with one of my clients, and there's a young doctor, and when I mean young, he's fairly young in the sense that he's probably a couple years younger than me. I'll be 39 in a month. He's 35. And this is a guy who went through medical school, and he's a surgeon, and basically, you know, according to the world, I mean, he's got his, his life set in stone. And so I asked him, you know, what he did on his spare time, and he's like, well, I'm an avid reader, but also I have this, like, very legit and awesome gaming system. And he then went through and named every gaming system under the sun. I don't know most of them. I remember some of them when I was young. He, I think he said he had a PS4 and... Uh, I think he had an Xbox, and then he named some other ones I've never heard of. And then he said he had this really nice TV and surround sound, and that he spent hours behind this thing. And the thing is, he's only working for selfishness, not to provide. You know, God wants us to get married. Wants, God wants us to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. But not only that, God wants us to be in the church, and he wants us to grow and to learn so that we can provide for others. God wants us to tithe. God wants us to give offerings. God wants us to give more of ourselves. But we can't do that if we don't learn how to work. You know, one of the things that makes you unselfish in this world is when you learn to get up in the morning and go do your job and come home and get a good night rest after a hard day's work. There's nothing more unselfish than that because honestly, if you've done a good, honest work, and I'm not talking just behind the pulpit, if you've just done a good, honest work, you don't have time for anything else. If you've ever had one of those days, I remember when I was an investment banker, I mean, we'd get up, I'd get up like at 7 o'clock, I'd be at the office like at 8 o'clock, and I wouldn't leave till 10, 11, you know, 11, 12 o'clock in, uh, in the morning, or 10 o'clock, uh, 10, 11 o'clock in, e in the evening, or 12 a.m., of course, uh, midnight. I remember I got home, I'd, man, I'd, those six, seven hours, five hours of sleep were, man, they, they were good. I love getting good sleep because they were just long, hard days. Now, the difference was that then we were just working for whatever that company was telling us to do, the money that, that, now the work is even sweeter and the sleep is even sweeter because the things that I do are just enough to provide for the family. I just do the things that God, I mean, I'm not saying that we're going to spend all the time in the ministry. I mean, some of us will, but the reality is that God, he, he made work so that we could go out there and provide for our families. And he made work so that we can have money in our pockets to put food on the table and you know, if our kids get sick, we can take them to the doctor. And if they need new clothes, we can buy them new clothes. But that's it. He's not asking us to go out there and prepare and lay up treasures here on earth where moth and, ru and rust doth corrupt. So the, it, so the reason I focused on this is because it's a, it, I think it starts with the spirit for us that are saved. You know, Paul could have focused on anything when he's, when he's writing to this church. And he's saying, look. I'm remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the side of God our Father. Now, he knows that not all these church members are elders and deacons. Some of them are tradesmen and maybe blacksmiths are in there and whatever other trades and, and jobs there was at the time. But he says, the thing I'm focused on is your work of faith and your labor of love and your patience of hope. And then... The only reason I brought this up is because when you're doing this stuff, then we bring it to God. We seek Him so that our yoke is easy and our burden is light. The second thing I want us to focus on is, you know, if we're going to work to provide, it's in, in all areas of our life. Well, how do we do that? Well, now let's back up. I kind of put the cart before the horse, but there's a reason that I did that. There's a, there's, a, there's a method to the madness. We have to work to learn. You know, before we can learn, or provide, we have to learn a trade. We have to learn something. The first time you go to a job, what's the very first thing they're going to do? They're going to give you instructions on how to do that job. They're going to teach you how to do those things. The first time you go to church, the thing that's important is that you get doctrine that's necessary for you to grow in the Word and know how to act in church and with other people and how to give the gospel. You know, there's a right way to give the gospel and there's a wrong way to give the gospel. There's a right way to knock that door and there's a wrong way to knock that door. I mean, I've been to, to seminars and I've been to... Preachings where they say, hey, don't knock the door like you're a police officer. You've already started on the wrong foot. You know, there's work knowing how to knock that door. There's work knowing how to ask the right questions. There's work knowing how to sit in the pew and, and uh, write the notes or take in. There's work on knowing how to hold your tongue if something needs to be said before you, you've uh, studied the whole matter. So work to learn. Go to 1 Thessalonians 4, if you're already there, in verse 9. 
And then after that, we'll be in, in, in Psalm 119. And then keep your fingers there in 1 Thessalonians, in, in either one. But in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 9 says, But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed, ye do it toward all brethren, which are, uh, which are all in Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. Well, how do you increase? You have to learn. You have to get good at something. You have to do repetition. It says, and that ye study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that ye walk honestly toward them that are without and that ye may have lack of nothing. See, they're giving them instructions on how to increase and it's not by being contentious and it's not by, you know, the Bible says admonish a heretic two times. And it's not by doing these things. It says, what does it say? It says, you study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. See, we know that he led by example because even Paul was a tent maker. And I know I didn't, I'm, I didn't even include those verses in here because it, it, it would have just been a really long sermon. But Paul, you know, he worked so that he could have time for the ministry to do the things that he did for the Lord. It, turn to Psalm 119. While you're turning there to Psalm 119, I'll read for you. Ecclesiastes 12.12 12 says, And further, by these my son be admonished. Of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. So we have to work to learn. We have to work to condition. Because studying and learning and putting our, 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 our hand to the to the grindstone or how they say, what, or however the term goes, you know, it's weariness of the flesh. But the more that we do it, what did he say in, in 1 Thessalonians 4, 10 says that ye increase more and more. Now we know we're going to increase, but let's not pretend that just because we're working, we're not going to get tired. I just want to point that out. But in Psalm 119, 65, how do we work to learn? The Bible says there in verse 65, it says, Teth, thou hast dealt well with thy servant, O Lord, according unto thy word. Teach me, who's teaching him? God, good judgment and knowledge, for I have believed thy commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I have kept thy word. Thou art good and doest good. Teach me thy statutes. The proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep thy precepts with my whole heart. Their heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in thy law. It is good for me that I have been afflicted. It's interesting how if we go back to 1 Thessalonians 6, we use the word affliction for following and work. It says, but let's stay focused at verse 71. It says, it's good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. So we have to work to learn. There's an effort that we have to put. There's an affliction, actually, the Lord says, that we, we, that we go through so that we could learn thy statutes. And I mean, a, a real quick application that just comes to mind is obviously, have you ever tried to memorize something? It's not easy. And your brain's tired, and then you get tired, and then you mess up because you repeat something so much and so much, and then you're like, did I get it right? And you got to give yourself a break and come back to it. There's a lot of work that goes into the Word of God, into memorizing the Word of God, into expounding on the Word of God, into preaching the Word of God, into going out there and doing the work, and then to learn not only that, but to learn what God says about providing, about being a man, about being a young single man, about being a young married man, about being a man that has a family with children, about being an older man who now has to teach the younger men, about being a man that stands on the rock, that is steadfast and unmovable. These are the things that are important. But today, society would have you think that any time that a man asserts himself, and that asserts himself in the stance of God or in church or for his family, you know, that his masculinity is toxic. And I actually am tying it to that uh, Gillette commercial that came out earlier where, you know, they made this thing, is this the best a man can get? Actually, it isn't. The best a man can get is Jesus Christ. The problem with the world is they don't understand what masculinity is because they have never read the Bible and seen what masculinity is. God tells us, you know, there's nobody more masculine than Jesus Christ. And, you know, Jesus Christ is nothing like what the world would have you depict a man should be. You know, so the, the challenge is we have to work to learn. So what, what's the next step? Then we have to work to teach. Go there to 2 Thessalonians. Well, actually, go to Exodus 4. 
And then after that, we're going to come back to 2 Thessalonians. I'll read a couple of verses in between. But go to Exodus 4. Where do we see this, this concept? Well, we're going to see it from, uh, in Exodus from the very beginning. I mean, and we see this before. Uh, this is the, just the example I chose for, for, uh, for this message. But in Exodus 4, verse 10, it says, And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And we know this is when God's telling Moses to lead his people out of Egypt. It says, And the Lord said unto him, who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb, or deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. And he said, O Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt uh, whom thou will send. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well, and also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee, and when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart, and thou shalt speak unto him, and put words in his mouth, and I will be thy mouth, and with his mouth, and will teach you what ye shall do. So God is the first teacher, so we get everything from the foundation, and that, that should be evident, I, I shouldn't have to go too much into it, but apparently, uh, in this day and age, we have to continuously come back to the basics and actually probably it's all there's nothing new under the sun so you know what let me just retract that statement for as long as men have lived we have to keep reminding them of the foundation in order for us to grow god is the first teacher but then he teaches us to teach others you know go to second thessalonians 2 and i'll read for you matthew 28 and a couple other verses in between but go to back to the second thessalonians and matthew 28 says go ye therefore and teach all nations and bap baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So God has commanded us that we need to teach others, and that we need to preach the gospel. That's a teaching. Well, that's work. We have to work to teach. But before we can teach the gospel, we have to learn the gospel. And sometimes, even after we've learned the gospel, we have to have someone train us on how to teach or give the gospel. Go, uh, John 14, 26 says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. You know, there's nothing to be said. Church is important. I mean, you, you should be going to church three times a week, in my opinion. I had a conversation with someone earlier this week that said, well, the Bible doesn't explicitly say that you should go to church three times a week. My rebuttal was, yeah, you're right. The Bible actually in Acts says that they went to the temple daily. And they went to church all the time. But at least three times a week, that's what we've grown up with. I'm not going to, that's not, you know, uh, that's, a, uh, that's a sermon for another day. But, you know, there's sermons out there that are called Three to Thrive and the, the importance of just being in the congregation. But the one thing that uh, is sure is that we, we should teach others how to be, in, not only in church, but how to be in the Word so that they can go out there and preach the gospel. It says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to remembrance whatsoever I said. And so even though it's important to go to church and it's important to do this, you know, what's more important, in my opinion? Get in the Word. And actually, I don't know if it's more important. The Word and going to church are synonymous. You want to get fed the word because, you know, when you're babe in Christ, there's things that you're not going to understand. Now, the Bible says that the comforter will teach you all things, but it might just take longer. So why not get around someone who's maybe understood it for a long time, like Pastor Cobb, so that you, know, you don't have to beat around the bush and take longer? Why recreate the wheel? Why make things harder? You know, why do double work? So it's good to go to church, but then you should also trust but verify, right? We should go into the Word and learn it for ourselves. And then there's times when the, where the Holy Spirit reveals things to us that maybe you just saw or it was your time or you studied a little bit more, and now you see those things clear as daylight. Acts 1.1, and state, you're, there, you're there in 2 Thessalonians, but I'm just, two more verses. It says, Acts 1.1 1, 1 says, The former tre treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. 
So out of the book of Acts, which is, we know this is the book of many, you know, this is basically the, what the people would refer to as the church age, but this is when you, you know, see growth in the church, you see growth in the members, you see salvations, you see the day of Pentecost, you see tribulation, you see persecution and constant preaching, even it is better obey God than man. And how does it start? It says they seize, uh, you know, uh, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. How did Acts start? With the foundation, Jesus Christ. You know, I know this is a famous verse, but in Acts 5, you know, when they're being uh, persecuted and they're, they're arrested, and it says, afterwards they were left, and then Acts 5.42 says, and daily in the temple and in every house they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. So we have to work to teach. And now I know I'm making this the spiritual application, but look, it, it is that important. Because if you're going to work to provide for your family, well, what are you going to work to provide? You've got to work to learn. There's work involved in learning, and there's work involved in teaching your, your children and teaching your wife at home to learn in the Word of God and to learn how to run the house decently and in order and to learn how to grow in the Spirit. And then we have to then teach them how to teach others. You know, one of the things that I'm looking forward to, I have two little ones, but will be when I take my kids soul winning with me because then I'm going to teach them and they're going to learn. There's going to be work involved for them to learn and there's going to be work involved for me to teach how to give the Word of God. Because at the end of the day, that's really the most important thing. And you know what's, what's interesting is if you learn the skills of the gospel, those skills will carry to any job or any career that you put out there. Because there's nothing like knowing how to find the main thing, keeping the main thing, the main thing. You know, I'm talking, we're going to see this here shortly. But let's go to 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 7. It says, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way, and then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Obviously, it's talking about the second coming, but there's important things. It says, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonder. See, we, work is designated for us. But there's one kind of work that's for the Lord, and then there's a work that's for Satan. That's why I put this in here. In verse 10 it says, And with all deceiv deceivableness and of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of truth, that they might be saved. Thy word is truth, the Bible tells us. Who's thy word? Jesus Christ. So they receive not the love of truth. So in the labor of love that somebody else did, they didn't receive that love. They didn't receive that truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should not believe a lie. I mean, that they should believe a lie. Sorry about that. And then verse 12 of that same uh, says, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but at pleasure in unrighteousness. So, I mean, the work that's most important is setting the foundation of your eternal destination. I, I didn't I actually rhyme, but I wasn't trying to rhyme it. That actually came out better than I anticipated. But, the reality is that once we've established that, then we know how to make every, all other purposes count for the best. Now, are we going to do it perfectly? No. But there's work involved in all of these. There's work involved to provide. There's work involved to learn. There's work involved to teach. And there's an importance to be said that where does work start? I really believe that it starts with the men. God has given a commandment for men to lead the church and to lead their homes. You know, because... If we're not leading, then, you know, I learned this a long time ago from, from leadership says, you know, if this is the top leader, the, and, I, and I, I probably used this maybe before, but the, the, the next guy in line, if this is what the top guy is doing, the next one in line is only going to do this much, and then this much, and then this much, until it becomes necessary for this guy to now understand that he needs to be at that level or better. But that's not always the case. People tend to follow there's nothing wrong with following. It's just you learn to follow to lead, and that's what the next points we're making. But the challenge is that if you aren't leading your home, if, we're not, if we don't have a good man behind the pulpit, you know, like Pastor Cobb's a, a preacher that's been tried and proven for 54 years, you know, the next guy in line is just going to do this much, and then this much, and then this much. And eventually what's happened is that because we don't train men to work anymore, what ends up happening is now we have preachers that instead of starting up here and setting the bar here, they're setting the bar here. And guess what the world's doing? Just right underneath it and they're following. So the next point is, 
work to follow. Go to 2 Thessalonians, I mean 1 Thessalonians, sorry, go back to 1 Thessalonians, chap I mean uh, chapter 2. So we work to provide, we work to learn, we work to teach, we work to follow. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 1 says, For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in and unto you, that it was not in vain. And I love that word. The more I've studied it, the more it really stands out. Now I understand why God uses it. It was not fruitful, that it was not vain, not, uh, not just like idle and stupid and without any purpose. It says, but even after that we have suffered, we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as ye know at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. For our exhortation was not of deceit or, unclean, or uncleanness, nor in guile, but as we were allowed of God. I love that. We were allowed of God. God allows us. He gives us that privilege to be put in trust with the gospel. Even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. And let's stop there real quick. The world has you believe that they're going to redefine masculinity. And what they're trying to do is become people pleasers. And the Bible says, look, he's allowed you to preach the gospel. And he says, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth the hearts. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness, nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ, but we were gentle among you, even as a nurse, cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desires of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. For ye remember, for ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblamably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children, that ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effecti effectually worketh also in you that believe. What, it, what is Paul saying here? He's saying, look, we led by example, and even at times we followed. He's giving the example of following. You know, we have to work to follow. I've always heard this said, but... There's something to be said about learning leadership. And one of the key traits to leadership is that you have to learn to follow. You know, and, he, and, and throughout the, 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 all the, uh, from 1 Thessalonians all the way to 2 Thessalonians, we see that he's constantly reminding them, look, we were with you in the trenches. We were leading by example. We were following. We were, we were there. We were getting our hands dirty. We were laboring night and day because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. Now, he, earlier we read, he, he said we had the power. In other words, we had the leadership. We had the authority or the ability to delegate. And at times we see that Paul does delegate. But he says, but, but here in this example, we, I left you that example. I was there with you. I was following. I was willing to get in the trenches. You know, and many times today, you get spiritual leaders that get behind the pulpit and preach the Word of God. They're not going to go out there and soul win. They're not going to go out there and minister to those who are hurting. They're not going to, you know, take time out of their busy schedules or their perfect little lives to go get in the trenches and, and just get involved and help somebody with a tough time in their life or to deal with a spiritual matter or just to go out there and spend a couple hours soul winning door to door. You know, I mean, think about how many preachers there are in America and think about how many people aren't knocking doors and giving the gospel. Now, if you were to combine all the people that go out there that we know of, that go gospel, uh, that go door to door, soul winning, you know, the percentage of preachers in that group already is small because obviously there's one preacher to a congregation. But if you then take into account all the churches in America, and all the so-called preachers behind the pulpit, that percentage is really small. 
And if you're not leading by example, how are you going to get people to follow? you got to first be able to get in the trenches. Be, and you know, that's an example of following. Because whose example are we following? We're following Christ's example. He's the one that gave the, the Great Commission. He's the one that said, go out there two by two. He's the one that said, go preach the word, you know, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. These are the things that are important for us to lead, uh, for us to learn to follow. I'm sorry. Now, you guys will go to 1 Thessalonians, but let me read for you Matthew 4 and um, Hebrews on that same point. Matthew 4, 4, 18 says, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. There's something to be said about us growing in Christ, and we have to learn to recognize that sometimes there's others in our lives and in the ministry that have leadership qualities and we have to then swallow our pride or whatever we have to do and follow. And that, that and I'm talking to myself as much as I'm talking to anybody in the congregation. Because Simon and Peter followed Jesus. Remember, Jesus did whose will? Thy Father's will, right? We have to learn to follow before we can lead. It says in Hebrews 13, 5, says, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have, for he had said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Remember them which have rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, consider in the end of their conversation. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. I think it's interesting because I did a, uh, I have a study on Jesus Christ the same yesterday didn't fall. But this verse comes after he's saying whose faith you should follow. You're in 1 Thessalonians. Let's go to the next two points and I'll close out. Uh, you got to work to lead. See, it's a progression. You learn so you can teach. You teach so you can learn. Then you follow so you can lead. And then you lead so you can follow. 1 Thessalonians 3.1 says, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it, good to be left at Athens alone, and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and ye know. I like that. He says, we're going to suffer tribulation, you saw it come, and you also know that it happened. We weren't lying to you. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the, temper, the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. But now, when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, that ye have good remembrance of us, always desiring greatly to see us, as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all, in all our affliction and distressed by your faith, for now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. And what Paul's saying here is you know, that he was comforted. He thought one thing, and he got a report of a different thing. But the point I'm trying to make here more than anything is, who did he send? Timotheus. See, Paul is the main leader, and who's following him? Timotheus. But now Paul says, hey, You've been following a while, but I need you to lead this. This main thing, since we can't get over there, you need to go do it. And then when, when Timotheus comes, not only does he come, we can see this, he comes and he asks a report, because in order for you to give a report, you have to take a report somehow, either asking or by observing. You know, and even if he didn't ask, have you ever seen somebody, like, uh, have you ever been in a job where there's a supervisor? You know who the supervisor is because nobody likes him, Right? And he's taking a report. He doesn't even have to ask. You already know he's taking, and you think he's writing something that you're doing wrong. Instead, these guys had a, 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 a fellowship of love towards Timothy. They recognized his leadership. So much so that they were either willing to be observed for a report or they gave a report of what was going on. And probably what happened was he probably went out there and worked with them for a couple of days and went soul winning and did the things and attended church. And he went back and said, look, but now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity that you have good remembrance of us always, 
desiring greatly to see us as also we see you. So we see that the, the leadership has now created other people that are following and it's bringing up other leaders. And now they're all working in unison to, you know, achieve the final goal. You know, and I'm not going to go in. I mean, we could go in. That's a whole other sermon of itself. But you work to lead. There's effort. There's purpose. There's goals that are behind this that you can see in Timotheus. It's one that for a long time followed Paul and he learned from Paul and he did the work with Paul and he was in the trenches with Paul. And now Paul's sending him out to do the things that he can't do. Then why do we have to do all this? I think it's a training. You know, one of the things that they do is when you go into the army, you go to boot camp and immediately it's a, like a, a unbrainwashing and a, a re-brainwashing to be instinctual, right? They take you through boot camp and you're constantly running and you're constantly working and they wake you up at all hours. And what are they trying to do is they make it instinctive where you're not having to react, but you respond in a reactive way. Like you have an actual trained response to the attack and you know how to deal with it. And, and the Bible is, works that way. When we get in the Word, what we're doing is we're working for these things. We're working to provide, we're working to teach, we're working to lead, we're working to follow, we're working to learn. But what ends up happening is when you tie it all together, it gives us the ability to work to war. You know, when we're fighting that good fight. Go to 2 Thessalonians 1. Go back to 2 Thessalonians 1. And then we're going to be in 1 Timothy. But in verse 6 it says, Seeing it is a righteous thing which God with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and to you who are, tr who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven in his mighty, with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power." when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Wherefore also we pray also always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith and power. God said, you know, the Bible is telling us here in 2 Thessalonians, and we'll go to 2, uh, go, uh, turn to uh, 1 Timothy just a few pages back, but he's saying, look, I'm going to come and take care of those that attacked you. Your only thing is you got to do work of faith with power. Don't worry about those who believe or don't believe. I've got you. I've got it. And he's going to come. How does it say he's coming? I mean, this is awesome. He says, and to those who, who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of our Lord. In other words, he's casting them out to hell, and he's coming to make good work of everything. You know, it, it, it's, it's reckoning time, and it's too late for them now. And he says, but the reason I did it is, wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. If you go to sec, uh, 1 Timothy 1, He's, in the Bible, it tells us, it reads, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into, this ministry, into the ministry. So he's allowed us, and now he counted us faithful, putting us into the ministry. Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Obviously, this is Paul talking. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to everlasting life. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. In other words, we did all of this because you're going to war a good warfare. See, we're in a spiritual battle. This is the time, you know, everything that we do might not seem significant 
at the moment we're doing it. Every time we show up on Sunday morning and Sunday afternoon and Wednesday afternoon and we make time to go soul winning and we make time to read our Bibles and we make time to pray and we make time to spend time with our kids and teach them and, and admonish them in the word of the Lord, all of this is charged that thou mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made a ship have made shipwreck, of whom Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered unto Satan, that thou may learn not to blaspheme. And then he calls them out. And then he says, look, here's what's going on. And when we read back in 1 Thessalonians, I mean, uh, our, our, our scripture for the day, 2 Thessalonians 3, he, he's saying that we should not have any fellowship in, in verse 14. He says, and if any man obey not our word by this epistle, Paul's famous for calling people out, but there's two callings out that he does. If we're looking in the word of God, number one, he marks them, those who we need to deliver to Satan or those who are uh, false prophets who are, you know, teaching damnable heresy. But then he's also saying in verse uh, 14, he says, and if any man obey not our word in 2 Thessalonians 3, 14, where we first read, it says, if any man not obey our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now the Lord of peace himself will give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of, uh, and then he closes it out. But what he's saying here is he says, look, these guys, and, and let's back up a little bit. I'm sorry. Let's, let's, let's really back up. Go to verse 11. Let me close this because this is going to close out everything. It says, for we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. See, a busybody is someone who's pretending to work, but they're not doing the work. And then he's saying, Now them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. In other words, if you're coming to church and you're not going to get to work, then just come to church and pay attention and eat that bread of life quietly. He says, But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. In other words, but you, you focus on the work. And if any man obey not the word, not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. If it gets so bad, you know what? Then he says, do, you're, he's still your brother in Christ. But that doesn't mean you have to hang out with him every two seconds. He says, have no company with him uh, that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. He said, you know, there's a difference. He marks some of them and says, look, these guys, we're going to withdraw ourselves from. The other ones, they might be in the congregation with them, but we don't want to have company with them. Now, it might even go so far as just not having company with them in the church at all. But he says, they just need to stay quiet until they can get into the job of doing, the, you know what he say? Be not weary and well-doing. The only thing I'm focused in, the only thing Paul wants you to focus in is doing the work that's the well-doing work. If you're not going to be doing that, if you're going to be a busybody, hey, then just... Stay quiet, do your reading, and then when you're ready, let's get into the, let's, let's go war of good warfare. Now, 1 Thessalonians 5.12, and we're going to close in this, is work for the eternal. We see in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 12, it says, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you. Obviously, that's the theme, right? Work, labor, we're interposing, synonymous. And are over you in the Lord and admonish you. We beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you. Look, find those guys that are doing the work and get to know them and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and hold you accountable. Admonish means like they're being tough on you. It says, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good both among yourselves and to all men. And then the reason I chose this is because we're working for the eternal, and this is a, a list of work. He says, rejoice evermore. Well, to rejoice requires some work in the word, so we know why we're rejoicing. It says, pray without ceasing. To pray without ceasing, that requires some work. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You know what? Giving thanks requires some, some effort, some toil. Quench not the Spirit. Guess what? Getting in the Word so you don't quench the Spirit, so you don't 
so you don't put out that flame, that fire, that zeal. Well, it requires some work. Despise not prophesying. Prove all things. Well, when you're proving things, that, that requires some work, investigative work, studying work, learning work, research work. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Well, that's tough, especially in this day and age. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. And so we're working for the eternal. That's why in the beginning of the message, and I'm going to close out with the same statement, this, is, this, this message is specifically to the believer. Somebody who's not a believer won't understand why we're talking so much about what kind of work we're doing. Because most people think about work and they tell you, hey, you just got to get a good job, you got to go to college, or maybe find a trade, get up every morning and do your work, and then go home and make sure it's honest and you have value and integrity behind it and you're going get to get promoted, you're going to make money, provide for your family, and you're going to have a retirement and two cars and 2.5 kids and a dog and a cat and a parakeet and a snake or whatever people do nowadays and you're going to have all the vacations and you're going to travel in Winnebago's and, and uh, cruises and you're going to die and that's it. And then, I mean, the work ethic's there, but it's not eternal. For us, before we do any of that, we set the eternal and we do these things and God will take care of the rest. He'll take care of the work that provides for our family. He'll take care of work, the work that puts money in our pockets. He'll take care of the work that will provide when we're unhealthy. He'll take care of the work when we, uh, we're dealing with issues at church. He'll take care of the work when we're looking for a good church, a Bible-believing church, because if you're in the Word, you'll know what you're looking for. He'll take care of the work when you're looking for a spiritual leader. He'll take care of the work when you're looking for doors to knock. And believe me, there's plenty of doors to knock, so that work's not that difficult. Just go outside your neighborhood, and there's plenty of places for people to get the gospel. So all that will be there. But I'm not, you know, because people tend to say, well, you know, we got to be careful about preaching. This is not, I'm not talking about work salvation I'm not talking about the things that you need to do to get to heaven. I'm talking about the things that you need to do after you get saved if you want to grow and be a man for God or a woman for God or a good son or a good daughter for God or a good church member or a good preacher or a good elder or a good deacon or whatever it is, to, whatever position you're going to take in the church. And then it carries over to your job so that you know when to say no to something at work. You know, because there will be times where you're, morality is going to be compromised and you got to know do I stand on God's promises and do I work for God or do I stand on man's promises and do I work for man am I a man pleaser or am I a God pleaser well I would my prayer is that you please God and that you do those things at the end of uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 so let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer Heavenly Father Lord thank you for uh, the opportunity to preach a message like this and Lord it's, I, I really was going to tie it more to that Gillette ad but I just felt like it was it was probably not fruitful and and it wasn't worth it the reality is lord if we're working on the things that we need to the cares of the world the affairs of the world won't be as important because we're too busy warring a good warfare so lord help us to focus to put our time our labor our toil our sweat our tears our sorrow our pain into the word into doing your will lord into going out there and leading souls to Christ, into learning and growing in the fear and admonition of the Lord, into raising our families correctly, into constantly be abstaining and removing those things that are evil in our eyes and not quenching the Spirit, into praying without ceasing, into giving thanks, and to doing all those other things that you talked about in your Word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.